three. All right, we are live. What's up, guys? Athey says this is TJ. Uh, we have a uh, very special guest with us tonight on uh, a Google Hangout. Um, we are sitting here with comedian, actor, writer Lou Perez of We the Internet TV. Uh, so I'd just like to take a moment to uh, graciously thank Lou for hanging out with us today and spending some time with us. Thank you, well, Lou. Thank you for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's no problem, man. Um, so ju uh, just for anybody uh, who might be watching the video later or who's watching right now who doesn't uh, know uh, what you've done or, or the things that you, you guys are doing right now, um, could you give us just a little like quick quick uh, synopsis of, of what you're into these days and what you're up to and, uh, and, and the kind of stuff that you guys are doing. Yeah, so uh, We The Internet TV is uh, a com comedy news channel. I'll put some uh, quotations around <laughs> that. So, right. uh, you know, we do uh, sketch comedy and we take on, um, uh, you know, stuff in politics, pop culture, online life and, and all that. We're on uh, basically all the platforms. We're on Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, all that. And we uh, produce new videos every week. Uh, so uh, we were originally doing like a new release every Friday and uh, okay. we've added to the mix uh, a new series called the uh, Lose Safe Place, which are, <laughs> which, are which is a, a stripped down version of Lou Perez where you get to uh, get inside my head a little bit more and I get to Ooh. be a little vulnerable. So Nice. <laughs> um. Yeah, uh, another thing I want to mention, I didn't uh, get a chance to uh, re uh, congratulate you on your recent nuptials. I know you got married recently, so uh, congratulations to you there, man. It's Thank awesome. You, Appreciate Free it. And that's, that's great, man. Um, uh, so, you know, I guess just the one question I have is, how, so how is married life treating you so far, man? Uh, so far, it's been, uh, it's been really great. Like, um, anybody who, you know, has gone through uh, the process of planning a wedding and all that, uh, can understand just the pressure that's on your shoulders. Um, so mm -hmm. leading up to the wedding, like, uh, you know, maybe like three or four months out, I was just kind of like maybe going a little insane. Uh, yeah. it was just all this stuff uh, happening at, at once. But, and, um, my, my wife and I, we both planned the wedding. Uh, we didn't do a religious wedding. Uh, we did, uh, we both, you know, put everything together and uh, I wrote the ceremony. We wrote our own vows. So it was very, it was very special and very us uh, what we did. And uh, yeah, it went off great. Um, it's, it's over before you know it, uh, which is uh, which is a very real thing. And then we got to go on our honeymoon, which was amazing. We went to France and Iceland, wow. uh, France and Iceland. So that was two weeks um, out of the country and also two weeks for the first time. And I can, and, I don't and ever that I have been two weeks without being on social media. Nice, so, you know. So I was I was completely unplugged from the matrix. I didn't know what was going on. Um, any news that came in seemed like uh, just rumors. You know, like I think, yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe Aretha. I think Aretha Franklin may have passed away uh, while we were away. It's like, nah, that can't be true. That's just that's just the wind talking. You know. Um, <laughs> But it was it was uh, it was fantastic to unplug and just see like like you guys might might notice that I'm a little twitchy and stuff. Like I got a I got a face tw twitch and my neck twitch. It's like I've just been back a couple of weeks and I'm already yeah. getting the the stress of being in New York and working and <laughs> trying to trying to release stuff. So if you can unplug, do it. It's Go very therapeutic, it. isn't it? Oh, <laughs> unbelievable! Yeah. Nice. That's... Yeah, I, it's it's kind of funny. Like one of the things I've noticed also too is like, like immediately I think you always have been, but like also immediately following your nuptials, man. It's like I noticed you you engage in a lot of cheeky like relationship humor and like, like how does your I have to ask, man, how does your wife take a lot of that like cheeky like I'm gonna make fun of this institution that I just took part in and my and like make fun of my old lady and make fun of myself being when I used to be single and like, right. how is she reacting to all that stuff, man? <laughs> um, she, she is, uh, she is totally cool about it. Uh, let me, let me just, let me give you an example of just how cool my wife is. Okay. So, uh, we both met online on, on this dating website called how about we, right. And how about we, I don't have you guys ever heard of that? That dating uh -huh. website? Before? No, I have not. So it's a little different from okay. Cupid and all the other ones, because how about we, you propose dates, you know, so you have a very like 
you know, a pretty basic profile and you propose these dates and it's like, how about we go to the museum? How about we check out this restaurant that I wanted to check out? And uh, me, I'm, I'm, I'm a comedian, so I, I didn't take it too seriously. So I would post things like, how about we eat a pot cookie and clean my bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, how about we do that? Like, that, could be, that could be a good thing. Uh, and, um, <laughs> That sounds awesome, though. Oh man! I got. I, I don't know. You guys are in. Are both you guys in Texas? Because uh, yes, yeah. Have, <laughs> we might have to make this happen. Um, so, uh, so Mother's Day comes around, and on Mother's Day, my date idea was: How about we make a date? And uh, and my that was my, actually my next question. <laughs> so then my future, my future wife sees that and it's like, oh, this is hilarious, and she uh, hit um, hits me up. And uh, when you're when you're interested in going out on a date with somebody, it's you're intrigued by it. Um, so she mm. was intrigued, and we started dating. And uh, it was like in- instantly we, uh, you know, we were just infatuated with it with each other. And uh, about like two three weeks in, I had to let her know that yeah, I'm moving to L.A. Um, so it was like almost immediately, like sort of like a heartbreak scenario. I'm moving moving to L.A. She's in New York. And, um, oh wow! Yeah, and we did. Uh, we ended up doing a uh, like a, a year long long distance, right? And and luckily we were able to uh, to visit each other. You know, every you know, like basically like every other month or something like that. We were I was either in New York or she was there. So about um, I'll say how long was I living there? I was living in LA. I think maybe about a month. And she came to visit. And I told her like, oh yeah, a few days ago, I was a guest on my buddy's, um, <laughs> my buddy's uh, podcast, and the episode was out. So I'm like, would you like to listen to the episode with me? So she's like, okay, fine. So we sat in my bedroom and we listened to this episode. And my buddy's podcast was called Duty Calls, Duty Calls, <laughs> and they are all shit stories. <laughs> how did i know that that's how that was going that's they're all shit stories great. but my story was a very specific kind of shit story my story was about the date i had the first date i had with a stripper who ended up shitting on my bedroom floor <laughs> it's a long story <laughs> you know, we, don't you- need to, we don't need to get into it right now <laughs> I was no, you, say we've got to now. We, we, I think I think I have to hear that. I yes. think I, not, not not want to, but I have to hear yes. that. Well, story. Well, the is, well, the reason why I brought it up is <laughs> the future Mrs. Perez is sitting next to me, while and we're both listening to this story that involves me going out with a with a stripper, anal sex, poop all <laughs> over my freaking <laughs> floor, all over my person. <laughs> He was still cool with it enough to be like, you know what? I'm going to continue this long distance relationship, and we're going to. I'm going to. I'm going to eventually move out to LA to be with you, and at some point, you're going to ask me to marry you, and we're going to start fam a family together and all that. So, uh, so that's yes, how cool she is. She's very cool, but but also I think I think what's what's really important is. Um, like there are a lot of comedians who will go and like complain about their girlfriends and stuff like that, or complain about their wives. And it's like, I don't have complaints about, about right. her. Right. So the jokes that I make up are jokes. Like they're not, you know, they, they don't necessarily You'd have to make it up. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or at the, I guess at the very least, I'm a good partner for her, you know, and I'm a, you know, I'm a loyal dude with her. So she knows when the jokes are jokes because yeah. you know we end up ha- we have a good relationship together. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So that was the long and short of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll have maybe we'll if 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 it's a longer story then maybe we'll have you back again sometime to tell that that that, would, that specific yeah. one. That would be wonderful. <laughs> that sounds uh pretty like it'd be pretty funny. Do I actors think, yeah. and comedians have to move to LA? to actually become successful is i mean is that a thing you just have to do or can you make it another way it seems like there's uh there's some people who've been able to you know make it another way like there's a really uh, this really great guy named chris gethard um who's from the uh, the upright citizens brigade theater in new york and chris is an incredible storyteller he's written books um he has a, a tv show that i think is going i don't know if true tv picked it up 
but he's great. He's I think amazing. I've heard of it. Yeah. He's an amazing improviser. Um, I think he's one of those rare, rare cases of somebody who has really been able to, you know, forge a career without having to move out to LA. Uh, yeah. But it seems like for the most part, most of the people that I know eventually are going to move out there um, to LA, um, whether it's um, to write for a TV show or to go out there for, you know, casting, uh, casting season and all that. Uh, I'm very fortunate in that I'm able with uh, the work that I do with We The Internet TV, we have a studio on the East Coast um, and my family's here and my wife is from New Jersey originally and we both love you know, uh, being in New York. So uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to uh, to do that um, uh, where that might not necessarily be the case for most of the most people. Yeah. Is that where you got your start? Did you did you were you into stand up first? I mean, like, tell do you have any like cool C stories or anything about like stand up? Yeah, well, um, well. I started doing um, improv and sketch comedy okay. um, y years before I did stand up. Like I think I was doing improv and sketch probably like five years before I even attempted to do stand up. But yet it was stand up was something that I always had wanted to do. But I mean, let's just be real. I didn't have the balls to do it, you know, until it takes, yeah, it takes some, uh, some cojones of, of yeah, some sort. It does. Uh, <laughs> uh, Actually, it's funny. Like, I kind of wanted to ask, there's, there's a thing that I did, like a sort of semi-political thing that I wanted to ask about that too. Like, what do you think about the, um, so, so Louis C.K. jerked off in front of a couple broads, right? And so now he's like t uh, taken leave or found it acceptable to, you know, try to get, get back on the horse and mm -hmm. get back into stand-up comedy. Like, do you think there's any problem with him attempting to get to get his career back on track? Like, do you, like are you do you support uh, his decision in that? Or I mean, yeah. Like, what's I, your take? What's your hot take on it? Is what I'm uh, asking. Well, I guess you know, I there are a lot of people out there who who I think are, are worth listening to um, for their takes on it. So uh, one person I would definitely recommend is the owner of the Comedy Cellar, named uh, Noam uh, Dwarman. And he did an excellent interview with The Hollywood Reporter, uh, I think it was like last week or the, or the week before. He has a really great take, and as does um, this, uh, one of my favorite comedians out of Arizona. He used to be in L.A. His name's Ty Rivera. Ty Rivera's phenomenal. I really love, uh, love what he does. Hilarious uh, comedian. So I'm just pl you know, plugging them for, um, you know, for, for the moment. The, the way that I see it, like something that, 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 kind of, that kind of irked me when I first read the... Um, the article in the New York Times was I felt like there were all of these were examples of, you know, uh, things that Lu that Louis C.K. had done to, um, you know, to, to these women, you know, obviously that he admitted and that some and it seemed as though the women involved, uh, he he had sort of made amends with these people, you know, at, with these private relationships. And it felt really weird reading about those relationships where it seemed like, hey, this is a private matter between them um, that happened yeah. you know, how, many, how many years ago. And now we have so many people who have you know, nothing to do with this guy's career, have nothing to do with the relationships or anything like that, seemingly stepping up and, and uh, behaving as though their forgiveness is what is, is, is paramount. That yeah. they need to grant forgiveness uh, to this guy. Um, I am definitely not, you know, not in that camp um, where I don't. I don't think um, I need to be uh, that. I'm an arbiter of some sort that I need to weigh in and say whether or not you know it's too soon for him to get up on stage or he should ever get up on stage uh, because we are talking about the livelihood of a person too. Yeah, uh, this is how this guy you know makes money, and and not only is it how he makes money, but 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 you know he is. A pro. He's one of the best stand-up comedians out there, and um, uh, and you know when you start comparing him to you know to other uh, to other comics, you know you have someone like like Jim Norton who brought up the fact that you know Richard Pryor, the genius Richard Pryor, used to talk about some of the worst things that he that he would do. I mean, he beat you know he beat his uh, his spouse and stuff like that, and yet he was able to to talk about about that on stage. Um, so, you know, it, it would be, it would be nice if, um, you know, outrage mobs made it very clear <laughs> on what is necessary to get redemption. 
You know, what is it that you need to do right. to, to really, to, to, to say, okay, it's over. Now it's time to move on. So. Well, it's a, in my opinion, I don't think it's ever enough for those people. Like right. that's the, I think the problem with, with Twitter outrage mobs and people trying to get people shit canned from their jobs and, and all this social media, you know, uh, people make it pariahs of people on social media is that it, it even if we've seen it demonstrated borne out so many times that even if you make a groveling apology or you know beg for for, for the forgiveness of you know, it makes like it worse and make yeah it does and it's never enough for those people mm -hmm. they don't care they want they want to see you cede the moral landscape to them that's the only that's like social engineering is their only like that's all they care about and they don't really care about your apology they want people to see you making the apology yeah there's like a, a know, like, there is like the public shaming uh, aspect to it and um, yeah it, it's it's uh, it, it's weird you know I, I've, I've definitely jumped up jumped on like Twitter mobs you know um, uh, when you know things have come up like controversial people like um, the New York Times hiring Sarah Zhang. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I, yes. I jumped I saw on that. That, bit and, that was a good bit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I jumped up on, on stuff like that. And, and you know, I, I remember I remember it was like the same day, like at, at some point when I just saw all these people kind of having like the same take and like jumping on her and all that. I was like, oh, I feel a little dirty. You know, I feel like uh, while, while I think while I think I'm my uh, my opinion might be might be correct, I feel feel weird being a part of the mob, even if we are all screaming the same stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and also, you know, like, like, you know, like you said, uh, you know, coming together and, uh, and not being, you know, like I, I definitely didn't say what she needed to do in order to, you know, cleanse herself of sin in my eyes, you know, I, yeah. I, you know, and, and really did I, you know, did I really care enough? Um, uh, probably not. You know? uh, the only thing that really, like why the only reason why I cared is it's like these people want to play tennis, but they only want the net up when their opposition is serving. That's a good point. Yeah, you know I mean that's totally a good point. Yeah. Um, that's if you're gonna apply, if you're gonna you're gonna claim the moral moral high ground and be outraged over this and that, and 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 claim your always claim that your opponent is a piece of shit, um, then you should play by the same rules that you're imposing on your opponent. Mm-hmm. And you know since I mean? we have a, well, this is our first comedian we've had, and TJ, since you and I are both free speech absolutionists or absolutists, um, this would be a great time to talk about, you know, what's, is there anything off limits in public speech? Um, uh, is there anything off limits on stage? What do you think? Oh, well, yeah, I get that. Uh, I've, I've, yeah, I've definitely heard that question uh, a lot. And, um, you know, I think it's, I, I think obviously, the touchier the subject, the more controversial the subject, the better the comedy needs to be, you know, the stronger the comedy needs to be. So I think you can talk about anything without a doubt. Um, but, you know, you, you, you might have to work for it. You might, you know, the, uh, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I just got Chris Rock, you know, um, was it uh, black people? Uh, there's black people and then there's niggers, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, even he like uh, there are stories about him, tr you know, when he was work working out that material, it wasn't working at the beginning. You know, the crowd wasn't feeling it, but then he got it to the, to, you know, he molded it to this place where it's one of the, you know, I mean, one of the the greatest, you know, stand up bits that at least I've, you know, I've ever heard. Um, so, so I think, I think you could definitely talk about uh, controversial stuff. There's nothing off limits, but hold yourself to a higher standard. And mm -hmm. if, if the audience isn't feeling it, it might not be because they're snowflakes. It might be because um, you didn't do a good enough job with the material, um, handling the material. So and a 9-11 a, a or a rape joke, if you're going to tell it, it better be damn funny. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I, I, I think so. Well, you know, I wish every joke would be damn funny. Right. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, like I, 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 I had one about, you know, 9-11 uh, years ago where I was like, um, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of Al Qaeda at all, but if there's one thing that, that we can all learn from them is that they take responsibility for their actions. And that's, yeah. you know, that's why, you know, <laughs> that is funny. That's that subtle, but good. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> good. The only place it's worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
what's the worst you've ever bombed on stage? I'm sure you've been asked that before. Oh yeah, probably the the pro the worst one worst I've ever bombed on stage was I did a a company uh, Christmas party, and I had a a professor of mine from NYU um, named Barry Goldsmith who actually hooked me up with it like years later after I graduated, uh, and I've been doing stand up for you know for a little while, and uh, it was company Christmas party and um, uh, it's in like the back of a restaurant. There's no microphone. Um, everybody is sort of seated in like these um you know these benches you know these like long tables and they're like facing each other and i'm in front of them with nothing you know with with no amplifier or anything like that and uh uh i start doing you know i start doing my my material i think like the first joke lands and um i start noticing that i start noticing like as i keep doing my stuff i start noticing the faces in the crowd and i'm like wow it's kind of like a weird mix of like very old people and then like young people and all that. So I'll say something to, you know, deliver a joke and the, the old people are just blank on their face. And the young people seemed almost embarrassed for me to be doing what I was doing there. So I was, <laughs> I, I was, so I think I was like probably like five minutes in where I was like, this isn't going well at all. And I had to do like a half hour and oh. I continued to do that. Yeah, I continued to do that, and then finally the uh, the CEO I think came up and like that was it, and like I got like an applause, and uh, <laughs> because there was like free food and booze, I hung around, and that was probably <laughs> the worst thing I could do because I should have just gotten out of there once he gave me the check, um, but I looked at the check and it was like for five hundred dollars, and I was like, There's, I do not deserve this. This is such. This is the biggest payday I've ever had in my life doing stand up comedy. I do not deserve this. And as I'm drinking and eating, I have, uh, you know, people coming up to me and they're like, tough crowd, huh? Ugh, sorry about that. Not, or then, or you'd have someone be like, hey, you know, I, I thought you were kind of funny. And it's like, oh, man, it was just nothing that Giving I wanted. Giving you the pity. Yeah, the pity. You're funny. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and I got I to gotta, I gotta tell you, I didn't think I was going to relive that day, but I'm reliving it right now. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that, that hurts, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know that's every every comedian's got a ton of those stories, right? So it's just it's a it, it's the nature of the beast. Yeah, yeah, that's what I keep telling myself. Uh, <laughs> that's what I keep telling. Myself. Yeah, you know, uh, but uh, it's you know it's something you grow from it, and, and uh, yeah, there is like a camaraderie too, like where you know you have uh, amazing comedians who, who still remember times that they bombed, and that's yeah. uh, so. That's, were the, that's the was that, that in the together. Was that in the Wicked Wicked Hammercats days, I guess, back then? <laughs> uh, oh, no, no, it wasn't that. For, no, it was the uh, the Greg and Lou, the Greg and Lou stage. Ah, okay. So, uh, I gotcha. Yeah, the Wicked Wicked Hammercats were uh, when I was at NYU. And then uh, shortly after that, we had like a big group of like 15 and then ended up being like eight. And then uh, um, everyone kind of like went off into their own little groups. And then um, my, my uh, comedy partner, Greg Burke, and I uh, did uh, Greg and Lou. So it was kind of. Greg and Lou was going on and I was doing stand up, um, you know, starting out doing stand up and uh, yeah. yeah, that's when, when it happened. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, so uh, the topic that we inevitably have to get to on the show, like we always go through this with everybody is so, how do you, how, what label would you describe yourself as far as like your religious affiliation or belief or lack thereof or whatever? Yeah, um, I yeah, I, I would still you know call myself uh, call myself an atheist. Um, okay. I, I would you know do that. Um, I'm I'm not as strident as I used to be. Like I remember um, years ago, um, I was at my uh, my older brother has a has a house in uh, in in Westchester, and I'm known for leaving parties in the middle of it to go down to the basement to take a nap. Like I'm an old <laughs> man. Like I need my nap, man. And I remember one day going, going down there and he had a TV on and for some reason book TV was on and I'm, I'm there trying to like take a nap and who's on it, but Sam Harris and uh -huh. Sam Harris was, yeah. And I believe Sam Harris was talking about, I don't know if it was a letter to a Christian nation or if it was the end of faith, but wh whichever one it was at the time watching it, I was like, Oh my God, this guy is saying is expressing so clearly 
and so precisely what I believe. And I'm like, this is amazing. I've never experienced this before. And um, so I think that was like a really, a really big, uh, big moment for me. And um, yeah. that led into, you know, uh, you know, reading more of like Christopher Hitchens and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and then like at the time I was a lot more, you know, vocal and like ready to take on people who are like, what you believe you're a believer. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I've, I've definitely mellowed out over, uh, over <laughs> the years. Yeah. And um, so r right now I'm sort of, I'm sort of in this, in this weird state where, man, maybe you guys can help me with it where I call it like a crisis of no faith where I'm like, where, you know, whereas religious people have a crisis of faith, I'm having a crisis of no faith yeah. um, because I'm, because, um, I'm very, you know, I just got married and all that, but, but even, you know, before that, like meeting my wife and when we like moved back to, to New York and there was just Is she so religious. Stuff. Uh, no, no, no. She, um, she's not, not religious. Um, um, I don't know if she would go go so far as to call herself an, an atheist, right? Yeah, right. not or anything like that. Yeah, non-religious. But yeah, what do you mean yeah. crisis of no faith? Uh, or do you have fellow non-believers that uh, is there a dearth of that in your community where you feel like you need to connect with fellow non-believers? Well, you know, what I mean? no, I, I think what it, I think what it, what it is is, um, you know, part of it is so much is going so well, and I've I've never been like happier in my life. And, and I, and I, and I know that that's not, that's not evidence of a, of a divine being, you know, whether things are going poorly or whether things are going well, but I've had quite a few moments of, of, um, I'm not going to say, I wouldn't call it ecstasy, but, but so many like moments of profound, like I am alive and wow, right. I'm so thankful to, to, to be, to be alive. So a feeling so, of transcendence it, as it were. Yeah. 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 There, there's a part of that. And I, I think the biggest, the, the biggest one is, um, you know, as a, uh, as a, you know, I self-identify as a, as a, I guess, a libertarian as, as well. Um, and for me, what's really important is the, um, the non-aggression principle, you know, the principle of non-aggression, where I think it's wrong to initiate force. You know, I believe in self-defense, but I do not believe initiating force. I, I like uh, exchanges to be voluntary and, and, and all that. And um, yeah. I guess what's sort of like, you know, what, what's sort of like tripping me up is when it comes down to like, morals and, and ethics um if there is not a a divine being or a master like that then what is to say that you know uh what is right and what is wrong and i know yeah. that there are so many more brilliant people out there who you know like who have uh, you know tackled this uh this topic yeah moral uh, sam harris has a book called the moral landscape that it, it tackles that exact issue and and yeah. the entire atheist community is divided right down the middle i mean it, it's a point of discussion between us and we will talk even tj and i will talk for hours on it yeah 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 and, and i'm reading I'm, I'm reading a book now you know I'm, I'm, my apologies if i'm like you know sort of like jumping over the uh, all over the place but i'm reading a book now um Homo Deus, um, which is by, I forget what the, Harari, I think his last name is. He wrote um, a book, Homo Sapiens, and this is Homo Deus. And, um, and he's making, you know, very clear, you know, very declarative statements. The soul does not exist. You know, human beings are not special. You know, just all, you know, all this stuff. The science yeah. says we are just material. And, um, and it might be, you know, you know, it might be that I am, too much of a coward to, you know, look into the abyss and see that. No, it, that no, might, that might be that. But it, it it is shaking me to my core, where I'm like, oh man, I think I'm special. Well, I think we're he, special. He's what he's proposing. Well, what he's a proponent of it sounds like is philosophical naturalism, where we're saying that. Well, well, the philosophical naturalists say there is no outside of nature. Nature is all that there is. That's the set of all things. The cosmos is what it is. There is nothing outside of that. There's nothing special. There's nothing transcendent. Now, I'm more of the methodological naturalist position where I'm, I would say there's no mechanism for us to test if there is a supernatural or not. So I'm not going to say that there isn't one, but we haven't found any evidence that there is like any compelling evidence. So we're not going to believe that until there's sufficient evidence to warrant the belief in it. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and, and I, I guess I'm, I'm, you know, sort of, uh, you know, sort of living my life as, as if there is a, you know, uh, you know, definitive, uh, 
you know, right and wrong, you know, at least trying my best, you know, to, to live up to that. Um, but, you know, I don't know. It, it, it bog, you know, boggles my mind, uh, all that stuff. So, so when I say like, you know, the crisis of no faith, that that's kind of where, you know, where I am. And, um, and, and I also think a big, a big part of it too, is I'm, I'm uh, you know, uh, when you meet uh, really great people, like I've met wonderful people who are atheists and I've also met wonderful people who are, who are Christian and, uh, yeah, and, of course, uh, in, in all, in, in all the above. And it's sort of like, Oh man, you know, maybe I'm, I'm missing out on a little something here or, you know, so well, that's one of the things we try to do on the show is bring people together of different disparate, um, religious affiliations, political affiliations, uh, you know, ideologies. I mean, ultimately ideology is not necessarily a good thing, but right. I mean, we try to get as many different viewpoints and as many different uh, build as many bridges as we can. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's where the conversation needs to start. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, uh, totally. And, um, yeah. And, and, and more than anything that, you know, there has to be, you know, a conversation like I am interested. Um, I, I've, I actually, I've wanted to reach out to a few friends of mine who are religious, but like, Hey, can I, you know, can I come to temple with you? You know, just to, see what's up you know yeah so, i saw your recent post about <laughs> being called a jew thing like oh like, yeah, what's oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what was it tell me if you want to talk about that a little bit yeah yeah <laughs> tell jim he doesn't i don't think he's seen it oh i mean it, you know you put out videos online and you're gonna get people who are very brave and anonymous uh who uh you know uh, this one guy I, I forget what it was exactly i don't know if you want to if you have it on, on hand, but, uh, uh, you know, he, he said, I, um, you know, I don't know if he called me like, uh, a, a, what's up with this Jew vision or something like that. Yeah. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah, something like that. He's like, Oh, I bet this guy's, you know, uh, mother's maiden name is Cohen or, or Goldberg or something, or something uh, like that. Was it? Yeah. Like the, the warring for the Jews or whatever, or something like that. He yeah, said yeah. that you were warring for the Jews or something. Some, yeah, something like that. And, you know, I just said, in, you know, in a cheeky way, like, I, I take being called a Jew a compliment, you know? It's like, yeah, oh, thanks, yeah. man. Thanks, thanks for complimenting me. I mean, I mean so many of my heroes are, are Jewish. But but beyond that, it's just, it's 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 amazing that uh, that we still have people who think that's an insult, you know? Like, throwing yeah. that around. Or, you know, See, the crazy. funny thing is, is that we, just, we have anti-Semites out there, and, like, these are we have all these far left ideologues like calling people Nazi left and right. Right. But right. they're totally ignoring the people that are actually being anti-Semitic. Right. right. <laughs> like, what yeah. The yeah. I mean, when people are taking like, you know, saying that this is a white power sy symbol or something like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's yeah. what we're spending, you know, some of our energy. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, ben oh. Shapiro is pretty far right and he's been banned a uh, deplatform from a lot of co college campuses and he's a Jew and they, he's been they accused of being an amp yeah. they call him a Nazi and he's an actual yeah. Jew and and right. Majid Nawaz is a Muslim and right. they accuse him of being a uh, uh, Islamophobe anti-Muslim terrorist yeah, yeah. or anti-Muslim yeah. extremist yeah yeah do you um well yeah I remember I, th I think Ben Shapiro I think he might have been in, uh, in a college in Chicago and they were calling like a white supremacist he's like I'm wearing a kippah <laughs> like you're not seeing my young yeah like, what it are you talking defies about defies logic yeah and and uh, do you guys know how um, i know majid had uh, sued the southern poverty law center he got I that think, uh yeah I he think got he it won that yeah he it got okay. rescinded i think he's off the list now uh he also got the one in britain britain's little watch list or whatever they had one too oh uh, that, i yeah, on hersey ali is still on the list though i think yeah oh wow I, I mean, I think those guys at one point did serve a, a, probably a needed um, function, uh, but it just oh, the, seems... The anti-Semites? The SLPC. Well, the SLPC. Oh, the or I mean, SPLC, yeah. Or SPLC, yeah. yeah. But I, I just think now they're just kind of too engaged in far-left ideology to, to really be relevant anymore, yeah, but I mean... There's a, a journalist named, uh, I think it's Ken Silverstein, uh, who wrote um, a piece years ago in, um, in Harper's. Uh, about it, basically laying out the case against the SPLC and, and showing just how much, uh, how much of it is really, um, you know, a, a way to raise millions and millions upon the, of dollars for the people who uh, who had it. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's it, it's pretty amazing just how, you know, how someone like Majid or you know any number of people can just be thrown on a list like that, you know. W 
with with almost no fear of of repercussions. Um, and you know, obviously, in the case with, with Majid, he did you know get off the list, and then also, uh, and, and I think he, he banked a a few dollars uh, too. Um, and I'm not sure necessarily how I feel about that. Uh, um, you know, when it comes to that thing, and what and what what implications that has on you know First Amendment you know, speech, but um, uh, it's a shame though because they the they used to be a credible organization that did some good. Some good. Mm -hmm. But. Yeah, now it and now it's sort of like when I you know see a friend of mine you know post something like a link like oh so and so is on the SPLC I'm like oh boy all right <laughs> it's like I don't necessarily think I I don't know if I can you know take the rest of what you're saying seriously. Do you do uh, any atheist specific humor on stage? <laughs> like uh, who's that guy? This one that his whole show is atheism. He's not a huge comedian. comedian. I'll, I'll look him up I'll while. Look him up. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Keith yeah, Lowell Jensen. That's right. It just came to me. Keith Lowell Keith Jensen. Lowell. Heard of him? Yeah. Yeah. No, he, no, uh, that's, all he that's all he does is talk about atheism. Oh. You do anything or do five minutes or? I'm, I'm wondering if I. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't remember necessarily if uh, if if I have like specific material about um, about atheism. Um, I do have a have a story like a, a story that that I told on a on another podcast about years uh, years ago. I went to the first annual uh, Galileo was wrong. The church was right. Geocentrism conference. You guys ever hear about that? Is that a flat earth thing? Or... Yeah. Kind of. Um, I mean, this is before like flat earth really took off and rappers started talking about the shit. Um, but I tell you, it was the first, it was the first annual one and the last annual one because they didn't have one after that. Um, but it was it was in um, uh, it was near the campus of Nor uh, Notre Dame, and uh, it wasn't at Notre Dame. It was at a hotel because Notre Dame wouldn't allow them to uh, you know didn't want to be, have any association with these guys whatsoever. Uh, but it was a really interesting uh, it was a really interesting experience, and I think one of the phenomena that I that I you know, sort of got a taste of is when I was I was in the room. It was sort of a conference room. And it was packed with people who were all listening to, you know, one guy was talking about how uh, Isaac Newton uh, viewed people as atoms. And, you know, <laughs> he wasn't, yeah, like I mean, I, he was a misanthrope, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, yeah. <laughs> Adams, assholes, and, and all Adams, that. Adams. You, know, so was like, you know, so it was like, it was all this stuff. And it was speaker after speaker. And it, this went on for a whole day of hours. I remember being in that room and looking around and it was like, it was like, oh my God, all these people believe this, um, and feeling like, <laughs> feeling like, like that little nugget, you know, that little, that little pool of people, like, oh no, the world believes this, and I think that can, and that's when I realized, like, oh, that can trick you, you know, the idea, well, if you're surrounded by, you know, a hundred people who believe, you know, something that's so outlandish, you might think that it's actually bigger than it than it is, and uh, you know, in the end, it was not. Uh, it, it didn't take off. Uh, I don't, I don't think. Yeah, no, I not not the whole geocentrism thing, but uh, for sure, man. If you've <laughs> if you've watched Great Debate Community or Non Sequitur Show or know who Steve McRae is, like he has a lot of flat earthers come on his show, oh, yeah. and they debate with like people who know about you know uh, geology and, and astronomy and astrophysics right. and stuff like that all the time, and and people who've just, been to people have been to Antarctica. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> people who like yeah. People who have like been to Australia, or you know, like right. they've seen the curvature of the Earth from sixty-two thousand feet, or, or whatever. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I uh, I had a bit where I said, you know, it's scary that you know it's year twenty eighteen, and there are people who believe that the Earth is flat. And I said, what's even scarier is I don't know enough science to prove them wrong. You know, so I'm like, oh man, like I'm kind of the illiterate one here. Like they're making YouTube videos oh, and stuff. All you need no, is a no uh, all you need is a big lake, a boat, uh, some walkie-talkies, um, a, a telescope, and a green laser. That's all you need. And just go out, go out a hundred yards, and with a yardstick on your boat, and you can measure it. There was a Discovery Channel. It's, it's a, like a five-minute video. Anytime, I refuse to debate flat earthers, but if they if they want to persist, I showed them this video. Watch this first. It's only five minutes. Right. 
and it and it shows it. it. Shows you it. go out varying lengths of distance on the lake, on the lake, and you can and the boat starts to disappear. Starts to disappear. And you can see it. You can look right through that telescope, and you can you follow the laser. We're not tricking you. It's he's disappearing off the horizon. Wow. But yeah. Yeah, and it, I think it's it, you know it's another example of you know at, at at some point you have to ask does the person I'm I'm talking to or arguing with is there anything that would that would persuade them is there anything that would convince them and for a lot of people it's just not you know if we're being real it's just not the case there isn't Ooh. anything you can say or show them that's going to make them change convincing evidence TJ this would be a good time to ask him the question we always ask everybody oh, oh yeah. Oh, no. Here we go. So, you, you, you ready, Lou? We we ask this. Oh, we ask we ask every guest this. So it's um so it's kind of a thought experiment thing. But uh, if so, you so you said you identify as an atheist, which means you don't believe in don't believe there is a god or gods. Um, if it was proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that today that there was evidence 100% certainty that there is a god that like the okay so let's take yahweh like the god of the bible okay. as described in the bible exists how would that change your life and would you worship it oh man um would i be an anti theist right i guess that's sort of the i sort i the, it's however you feel like you want to explore that experiment oh wow um Man, how yeah, how would how would my life change? I mean, I'd probably start going to going to church. I'd have to, right? I was about to say, but, would you save your skin or would you take a moral I mean, stand I, or Well well I think I, I you know, I think it would be like, <laughs> hey, you know, it's about time. Thank you. <laughs> you know? All right, yeah. Yeah. Um hide and seek champion like, of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> Like where you been, man? You went. What did you say, TJ? Hide and seek <laughs> champion, champion of the universe. Of the universe. <laughs> right. um, That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, why? Well, I, I would wonder, you know, how Yahweh or that being wants to be worshipped. You know, um, uh, questions of, you know, I, I wonder how directly the the relationship would would be between the between the two of us. I would definitely have a lot of a lot of questions. Um, yeah. Um, I would probably be, yeah, I mean, I'd probably be more enthralled and, and sort of, uh, you know, sort of taken aback. I mean, if, if you think about right. like I just came back from, from my honeymoon, um, I said in France and Iceland, and we, my wife and I spent, I think like four or five days in Iceland, and I was completely blown away by the beauty of the landscape. It felt otherworldly, like I was on another planet. So I would have to imagine that coming face to face with, you know, the creator of the universe would be, you know, infinitely uh, more, uh, um, you know, more, uh, I don't know, mind, like, mind fucking, I think. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> That's it would fuck me up it's even more. So, yeah, I don't know how I, how I would re respond to it, but I, uh, I hope he would like me. So. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I don't want to I mean, bomb that. I, I don't want to bomb that show, man. I definitely don't. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, because from my my perspective, it's like yeah. Because yeah. I mean, if he's if he's real, then like hell is in play, right? Yes. Because if he's if, then if hell is in play, that's something you have to consider and how you proceed at that point. You know what I mean? Like, sure. do you have no choice but to save your skin and be like? Yes, uh, everything I'll do, do it all, and and you know whatever, or or do you say you know like like you said like I think that's more likely for a lot of people like as far as people I know and myself is like I'd have a lot of questions you know like he did some pretty heinous shit in <laughs> that book <laughs> that you need to like explain to me like what your reasons were for doing that like if you have good reasons like then i could be like oh, okay but, but, but like what 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 does god want with the starship is it wasn't that from a, from a star trek movie or something like that yeah <laughs> what, what is it that was undiscovered country or something like that maybe, yeah, maybe. i can't have, remember yeah. i can't remember which one but if you have yes. even the most rudimentary concept of eternity and the most rudimentary concept of pain i don't see how anyone would not immediately drop to their knees and start repenting their ass off 
Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Well, I guess the question you know that I, that I would have is I know um, I know just how important uh, faith is you know for among you know uh, religious people. Um, well, faith would disappear even, in that sense, wouldn't it, Louis? Right, right. Yeah. It, it, well, you wouldn't need that, faith that, anymore. Well, well, that, that's what I mean. And, you know, often I, you know, I think about, you know, you have, uh, you know, Paul um, on his way to Damascus, where I guess he was Saul, and then he had the conversion story on the way to, to Damascus. I mean, he had the, you know, firsthand experience with the Almighty, you know. Um, or Thomas, you know, who got to put his, got to touch Jesus' wounds. The wounds. Right? He, didn't, the he didn't need faith anymore. <laughs> Yeah, and it, so that, that's something that that, that I find um, you know interesting and, yeah. and troubling, and trying to get my, my 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 mind around because it's sort of like, well, yeah, now you guys like me because I've made myself known to you, but um, these people with with real faith, those are the those are the people yeah. that I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna rock out with. So. I, don't know. I don't know. To me, it's like, why would he, why would a, why would the creator of the universe uh, design humans with? the faculty to reason and distinguish between what's false and what's true and then command us to believe in him on bad evidence. I think yeah, that was like, I mean, a, like, like a, that's kind of like a Bertrand Russell thing to, uh, yeah. he was asked, you know, why give us um, that if, faculty? Yeah. If, if you, if you were, I think he was asked like, if you, if you were to meet God, you know, tomorrow, uh, and he asked you, you know, you know, why didn't you believe in him? He would say, because you didn't give me enough evidence. Didn't give me enough evidence, governor. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Look at us Americans shitting on the English. <laughs> hmm. we, were the, do, we were doing that way before me and you were doing it, though. <laughs> someone in the chat said, if you've been, con if, the big if there, if you've been convinced by the evidence, you therefore believe, which is the only requirement to get into heaven. I'm telling him, yeah, that's right, but you also, according to the Bible, have to accept Jesus as your Savior, right? Yeah, so I guess we're talking about a very specific, um, you know, version of of the of the deity as well you know yes it's sort of all the bad you know depending on which one you pick it's sort of all the baggage comes you know comes along with, with that and he said would he be into shit jokes and would he get irony right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny I, I i had an idea actually for a uh for a sketch about what um when satan you know says uh you know it's better to to reign in hell than it to is serve to heaven. serve in, in heaven. <laughs> I just imagine like he has like a buddy who's like, dude, you sure you want to go into business for yourself? Like, yeah. it's, a lot of, <laughs> it's a lot of responsibility, yeah. man. It's like yeah. running this whole train alone by yourself. Like, I don't know, man. All the, all the, um, out the, all the big, the big headliner atheist comedians do at least maybe a small section. If they do an hour, at least five or 10 minutes of it is strictly shitting on religion and it seems to go over well especially if you're in la very liberal crowd seems like that would be the way to go like bill maher he's always doing it oh tim minchin in anyone that's really out about it have you ever considered working that into your set um well i really like that that song that, that tim minchin did um i think i i don't know if it's a it's around the holidays like a christmas song but my uh um my, my comedy partner greg often often shares it it's a it's a really uh a really good song. I, I think, um, you know, like you say, like a lot of them, you know, spend their time shitting on on religious, uh, on you know, Christians and and all that. I'd probably want to stay away from, you know, just you know, doing what everybody else is doing. Like uh, I would, I, I would want, like to explore a way of, you know, maybe there's a way that I could, you know, shit on atheists rather, you know, and all that. And, that would be yeah, awesome. There's, you know? there's a, there's, there are segments of the atheist community. Oh, that, people like self-deprecation <laughs> too. Worried, worried yeah. Shitting on. <laughs> if yeah. you shit on yourself, that goes over well, it seems to. Oh, or on Lou's yeah. floor, apparently. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she got a second date, boys. I'm going to tell you. Did I'll she? Man, I got to so it. hear that Dude. story. Dude. She what a guy, that. dude. What a guy. She like that. She earned that second date, no doubt. Um, <laughs> that's <laughs> well, like the opposite of, of patriarchy, man. That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> matriarchy. <laughs> well, you, know, you, know, they, they, you can they, shit they, on a dude's floor and he will still date you. <laughs> well, you can shit on, on Lou Perez's floor. And yeah. he'll, still, he'll still date you. I, I want to yeah. separate myself from the other ones. Um, if, if, you know, if my, my wife and I didn't, you know, hit it off and, and you know, eventually get married, I probably would have that in my dating profile. Like, Hey ladies, just in case you're a little, you know, if you're feeling weird or anything like that, just don't worry, just go for it. 
Um, it's all good. Um, <laughs> you know, just, 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 just to talk funny. a little bit about, uh, go back to what you're saying about, you know, doing, uh, you know, atheist material in, uh, you know, in bits and all that. I think it was, it was a short while ago where I saw online, uh, I think he was like an, uh, an artist, like a painter or something like that, who uh, went and did like all this, like, like nuns, like naked nuns, or, you know, the crucifix was like a, was like a, a phallic symbol and all that. And it's like, man, I, I can't imagine being, being the dude who thinks making fun of Christianity is edgy. You know, like there's still that somebody seems like there. edgy for its own sake, just bl blasphemy for its own sake. That's doesn't seem like comedy to me. Or, or or just or just uh you know just like oh man i'm really taking risks here and it's like eh, yeah it's really it not. doesn't seem so edgy in pop culture i mean it's it's right prevalent it seems like i, I don't well, want to like this show for us uh, on atheist edge whenever we do live there's it, it's a no it's so easy i mean once it's live i don't touch it in post it just goes on our channel and so it so these are easy days the the hard days are when we get together and do 13 hours of pre-recorded shit and now i have to i got you know six hours of editing for every 30 minute video so on your show i see it's like heavily scripted comedy sketches and that requires a lot of editing do you do that yourself or um i i work with with really great people so i work um uh, collaborate with um, my partner Greg, who will often direct and edit. Um, and you know he'll send cuts, and you know we'll we'll give notes and go back and forth. Uh, actually, a, a video we just released um, we re released yesterday on Facebook and this morning on YouTube because we had a little audio problem. It's uh, it's called uh, "Stop Making Me Defend Donald Trump," and uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> So it's doing really well on Facebook. I'm re I'm really happy, and I, I hope it blows up as you know we all do for you know every everything that we make. Um, but that that was a I think it was a, a really good example of a video where if you saw the first cut, um, it's very different than than what was in the final cut. And uh, yeah, so you're you're always dealing with issues of pacing. Um, you know, sometimes jokes need to get scrapped outright because they just don't play on camera. Um, you know, so. Uh, so so much lives and dies in the editing room. Um, whereas um, I'm actually really jealous of you know guys like yourself and, and also people like like Dave Rubin and Joe Rogan especially who are able to have these you know these long form conversations and to keep them moving, keep them keep them interesting, and keep a you know, keep people tuned in. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, hopefully that's happening here. Well, Lou, you don't have to pigeonhole <laughs> yourself. I mean, you can, uh, of course, you're already aware of this, I'm sure, but don't limit your creativity because on YouTube, there you can divide everything into playlists. If they don't, they don't you can experiment and branch out and do other shit, but just throw it in that separate pr playlist. And if they don't want to look at it, then, you know, it's 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 partitioned. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. And we're actually, we're, uh, we're looking to start doing live stream from uh, live streaming from, from our studio. So nice. uh, it's a great opportunity for us to, you know, uh, bring on guests that we've always wanted to bring on uh, personalities that, that, you know, you can't necessarily, you know, collaborate with every, um, you know, with every person out there on a, on a sketch or even a monologue or, or even doing uh you know, a, uh, you know, an interview, but if we can get them all together as like a round table discussion, there could be something, a lot of fun, uh, oh, yeah. there and, and a lot of interesting, interesting stuff can come out. Do so, some, so we're, all, we're all looking to doing that. Yeah. Do some name dropping. Who have you rubbed elbows with so far? Oh, who, uh, Oh, well, I think, uh, well, probably the biggest, uh, the biggest person, uh, that we worked on, worked with, well, uh, literally, um, is a uh, Grizz Chapman. Uh, he's, he played Grizz on 30 rock. Oh yeah. Uh, so, oh yeah, which one was yeah, he? He he was Grizz. He there was a uh, Grizz, one of the bodyguards. So it was like dot com. Yeah. And, uh, and oh Grizz, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. And Grizz, well, yeah, Jordan, uh, a, Jordan, Jordan, Tracy Neil? Jordan, Tracy, Tracy Jordan? Jordan. No, that wasn't Tracy Jordan. No, it was Tracy Jordan's bodyguards. Yeah. 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 Right, right, yeah. Yeah. He was like the, the big guy. Yeah. And um, so he's been in a in a number of our videos. Um, actually, one of the videos it's um, he was in it's uh, a mon like a monologue on him. It's called "Shocking Prison Secret," and it's oh, I know, accepted. I know who exactly you're talking about. Then, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, it's been it's actually been accepted into I think the Austin I think it was like the Austin Comedy Festival, and I don't know if that or the Austin Shorts Comedy Festival or something like that. 
Um, but but that's in there. And uh, another person I think you guys, maybe your, your viewership uh, has heard of is uh, Dr. Uh, Deborah So. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the Playboy so uh, analyst. Yeah, yeah. So she was a neuroscientist, and she she writes uh, for you know popular magazines like Playboy on you know the intersection of science and technology. And we did we did a great uh, what I thought was you know well I think it was great because she was in it um, a series called Sex, Gender, and Bullshit. And uh, she was, she was awesome. And, you know, it really goes, and now she's blowing up. She's been on Dave Rubin. She's been on Joe Rogan and I'm, I'm so happy for her. And I, I really love, she's a great writer. I really love um, how well things are going. And she, it's an example of somebody where I saw her, she was on the Luke Thomas show. I don't know if you guys know Luke Thomas, but he's a, an MMA commentator. And this was shortly after the, the Google memo came out, James Demore's Google memo. And they were both, uh, she was a guest on it, talking about the Google memo and also her mm-hmm. uh, fondness for, uh, for mixed martial arts. And I, you know, dropped her an email and said, hey, I, I saw you on this and uh, I think you're great. I, w- I would love to, you know, interview you somehow. And she was totally down. She flew from Toronto to the East Coast and, um, you know, sat with me for, you know, a couple hours and, and did that. And, and then she went That's home. That's awesome. Uh, I think my yeah, favorite so, one was uh, "Who's better in bed, conservatives or liberals?" That was my favorite bit with her. I thought that was yeah, like, and, that, and that was based on, a, on an article <laughs> she wrote. Yeah, that, that article I think you can find in uh, in Playboy as well. And it just goes to show you, like, it's just so crazy how how fortunate we are to be living in the times we're living, where we where you can reach out to somebody whose work you read, whose videos you watch, mm. and and connect with them. And that's just it's awesome. It's just sad that we have a we have a a very vocal, a, a very minor, but yet shrilly vocal group of people who are like trying to do away with things like that. They right. want, they want you to not, they want you to only be able to listen to the things that they agree with. And if our and, show is any kind of set, uh, carves out any kind of niche, it's that we accept everyone on our show. And uh, we always end with a handshake. It could be we could have the most extreme views pitted against each other on our show politically socially culturally but we always it's always a civil discussion we end with a handshake and it just dawned on me i'm surrounded by liberals right now <laughs> i mean uh libertarians 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 well well yeah what wouldn't you be you i think you're you're a libertarian right tj no i'm kind of more like center Center right, oh, okay. center, yep. Yep. center, center right, right sounds like, about right. And then so like on some stuff, I'm left leaning on some social issues, but like fiscally and for the most part, I'm like center right. But yeah, that uh, some of those you, things you described on your channel, I'm gonna. This is great because I, you have a library of work. And I have I have not seen it, so it's like a shrink wrapped new toy to me. I'm gonna get to just go and binge it all now. Awesome. Well, well I think what's really important um, is you know getting away from purity tests for the people who you who you want to associate with. And yeah. I think I've been I think because you know I'm, I'm a libertarian, conservatarian, depending on you know what issue and all that, and also my background, you know, growing up in in New York, and I have an immigrant father. Um, my brothers, you know, and I have a Puerto Rican um, sister-in-law, a Dominican sister-in-law, you know, all, all this stuff. Um, it's put me into contact with a lot of different people, a lot of people with whom I disagree. And if I was, you know, if I was forcing everybody to, to take a test, a purity test, to see whether or not yeah. I would associate with them, I'd be alone, man. I'd be so alone. It'd be so boring, um, you know. <laughs> um, so, so I think even, you know, even when you, with, even within minority groups like libertarians, the infighting is ridiculous. Like it's insane. It's sort of like sabotaging. Um, there's often, it seems like self-sabotage for the sake of, I don't know what, what the sake of, because you're not pure enough because you're not a real libertarian, et cetera, et cetera. And then I guess you see that in a lot of other groups, uh, as well. And, um, just, just being in this situation where, it's sort of I could make fun of everybody and also having a, the vehicle to do it. Um, you know, I like being able to make fun and then also, hey, maybe that starts a conversation. Cool. Let's uh, let's talk about it a little more. You said uh, you had a segment or a series that was um, stop making me defend Trump. So do you do you normally defend Trump's policies or uh, do you side with him? 
Um, well, I think I think it's 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 sort of that thing where um, you know, if I hear Trump did this, right? Um, I I need to say like, well, wait a minute, I probably can't take that on face value. I probably have to read a little bit more into it. Um, and you know, if if he does something that I agree with, cool. If he does something that I disagree with, then you know, you'll hear from me uh, as far as that goes. Um, and what I what I sort of feel, what I feel like is in the in the realm of comedy, there you know, there is no shortage of people uh, holding Trump to account for what he's doing, you know, and uh, uh, which I think is a really good thing. And but it also opens up opportunities for me to do other kinds of jokes that maybe people aren't, you know, aren't necessarily. Um, uh, going to see on other channels or in other formats. Um, so yeah, I mean, if he, if he does something that I, that I agree with, cool. If he does something I disagree with, you know, I'll, I'll have my, uh, my criticism for that as well. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that's the best way. It seems like, yeah, you are definitely a minority and, uh, a platform like YouTube slash Google slash alphabet. Um, if you lean right, it, it from my experience, it, the writer you go, the more of a chance you're going to get shadow banned or um, just pushed and marginalized by the platform itself or demonetized. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, even, you know, just just on a, on a very small, like just a really small thing. Like, for example, there are channels that I've been a subscriber to on YouTube for years. Right. And I subscribe to them because mm -hmm. I want to see their material. And you even hit the bell for notifications, I bet. And you still don't. It doesn't show up on your news feed, does it? Well, 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 it used to be where it would show up in my inbox. And that would be great because I would be reminded that this person exists. Like, oh, I haven't watched a video in a while. And, you know, I would go. Now I, I, now I go and I'm like, oh, I, this guy's been releasing videos for months that I haven't seen. And it's that's like. Called, look, that's called shadow banning. You know, that happens. And, it, and, it, and it's really crazy as a, you know, as a consumer because so I'm like. You know, um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's 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 really tough because I'm like, look, just let like if you don't even want him to get any new audience members, right? Just send them to me. Like then I'll be that one <laughs> of you. You know, <laughs> right? You know, because I'm asking for it. Um, so there's a lot of just stuff like that that I'm like, oh man, you're playing dirty, man. You're playing really dirty, and that and that stinks. Uh, like, um, oh. Uh, there's algorithms that, you know, search for keywords. And if, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 when do you say it in your video? Um, if you say it in the first 17 minutes of your video, a specific word like rape or Islam, it, you said the N word in the first five minutes of this show. This show is definitely not going to get monetized. Not that I care, but, and you said it in a particular content, but context, but yeah, that, context that doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. It, context doesn't matter to them. Yeah. And it, I, I, the, the word is said and. Yeah. I remember, um, I, I think uh, Joe Rogan was talking about a, um, I think having a, a doing, doing a meeting with someone or, or knowing somebody from who works at Google or, or YouTube and bringing up um, in a discussion between Douglas Murray and Sam Harris, I believe. And how it was like instantly um, demonetized because it was hate speech. And he's like, "Did you even did you even listen to it? Like what? Then, you know?" Nope. And it's just you know throwing these these things out. And and I I, I really think that you know uh, I think I think we're we're all losing a lot if if that's the way things go, where um, where we're not even uh, where where things are being mislabeled to such a degree that they just you know they practically just disappear. Um, and uh, yeah, it's upsetting. Uh, September 29th, our, we are hosting a live show with Richard Carrier. He's a Jesus mythicist. I don't know if you're... Whoa. Yeah, he's he's a he's a big name. But prior to that, we're doing an all-day studio recording. And one of our guests is an ex-Muslim, atheist, far-right, Kekistan Trump supporter. <laughs> so we're, we're ready. I mean, we'll take on anyone on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, no, nothing's off limits you know there should be it's absolute free speech marketplace of ideas we're one of the only channels that i know of especially atheist channels um that we never block we don't ban we don't censor we don't curl t curtail any opposing viewpoints at all anything you post on our channel it stays there 
yeah, which is a I rarity am, now. Yeah, I am always skeptical of anyone who tells me I shouldn't listen to so and so, or I shouldn't read this book, or I shouldn't watch this, or I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that um, because ultimately, uh, I think I'm a better judge of what I should and should not be uh, spending my time on. Um, I, I love recommendations. If you're like, you should read this book. I'll check it out. You, you should see, see this movie. I'll check it out. But if it's like, no, you should not because so and so is, you know, uh, a hater or you know, hate, you know, just you're in New York right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and you are you back there permanently? Oh yeah, yeah. We moved, oh so New uh, York's another good. Of, I mean, it's just like L.A. as far as the comedy scene, right? But is there a big difference between the two? <clears throat> yeah, I think when I was in, um, I remember being in L.A. and I would listen to. A couple of a couple of podcasts that were taken that that were uh, recorded in New York, and the, the actually the one podcast in particular it's called Race Wars, um, and it's with um, Sherrod Small and Kurt Metzger, and I remember like driving around because you're always in traffic in L.A., and I remember listening to to Race Wars and being like, oh man, like this is this is the this is the energy and the vibe of New York that I'm just not getting here in LA. The, uh, the way people were speaking, the topics they were covering, the, the honesty that, that, that was coming out and the willingness to go places that, you know, I mean, as corny as it sounds that I, I hadn't heard people go in a while. Um, and, it, and actually listening to that got me missing um, New York and, and, um, and you know, uh, being back, I mean, there's so many places you can get up and do, do stand up. Um, I've been really fortunate to uh, be a guest on the Live from America podcast, which has uh, recorded um, a couple of f stories above the uh, the Comedy Cellar, um, and it's put me in, in touch oh, with that's really, awesome. uh, great people. Yeah, yeah. Have you done a set at the Cellar? No, no, I have not uh, yet. I'm, I'm, well, uh, I'm well, hoping. What do you have? What kind of hoops point. do you have to jump through? I don't know, but I'm I, I'm, I'm willing to jump through them. <laughs> we'll see. Right. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, um, TJ, we have yeah. like seven or eight minutes left with Lou. So yeah. any any saved rounds, you unload on them. Yeah, I, I one of the things that I recently saw that you did, it was sort of like a monologue form, short monologue, but was uh, it, you were saying basically if you're going to be racist against white people, you better make sure that you can kick that person's ass. Like yeah, what was the yeah. what was the impetus for that? I just have to ask because yeah, I, um, the well, yeah, I think I what, what was the uh, the exact line? It's something line like yeah, um, if you don't believe you can be racist against white people, make sure the white people you're being racist to, being against, racist yeah. to also agree with that because you may be walking into an ass kicking. Yeah, <laughs> volunteering yourself for an ass kicking. Um, I think it, it came. Uh, it definitely came after the Sarah Jong thing on. Um, uh, you know, the, her controver her tweet uh, controversies and uh, what, you know, th she seemed to have a, a long history of, uh, you know, making, making these, you know, racist um, statements about, about white people. Yeah. What I found was a lot of people were like, well, some of it was her, you know, uh, sort of taking on the persona of the trolls that were, that were heaving this terrible shit at her for being Asian and a woman. And I was yeah. like, oh, I, I get that. Um, I'm like, oh, you know what, man, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I, I overreacted, but then I read some other stuff from back in the day that she also, that she also said, um, yeah. and, you know, it's sort of, you know, having gone to, uh, having gotten like a, you know, a liberal arts degree and, um, having been in, in New York and, and I've heard people say before that, you know, you can't be, you know, you can't be racist against white people. Right. Uh, so you don't and, subscribe to the power plus, plus privilege, like no, paradigm no. of, okay. No, no, I, I don't. I don't subscribe. Uh, I, I do not subscribe to it. And I think I was giving some really good advice too um, about that because you know, in much of the same way that you think, you know, there are white people out there who, you know, think they can just, you know, drop the N word, um, unlike the context in which I dropped it, uh, who think they can just drop the N word and, and everything's yeah. going to be cool. It's like you know, you got to understand. Like, there's some people who aren't going to take it that way, right? right. And um, yeah, and I felt like you know, it was, it was a you know a, a good opportunity to. Uh, um, you know, teach kind of wax teach. philosophical. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and... it's a good point though. I mean, 
Yeah, like for you know, for for example, it's I, I, I you know, I, I judge people um, as individuals and in, in, in who they are, and right, um, and and how they how they treat me and how they treat others. And I'm very fortunate to have wonderful people uh, out there. And I I've been trying to talk to people the way that I would want to be spoken to. And, yeah. uh, and one of that is like, you know, is, uh, you know, just being straight with them. Like, Hey, you know what, if, if you think this, then I think, I think you're, I think you're, you're shitty for thinking that. And I'll, yeah. you know, I'm more than willing to tell you that. My, my, t- it's like what I've always found <laughs> comical is it, it's these, usually it's, you know, it's these far left ideologues that are kind of pushing this narrative of power pro- plus privilege. But yet, okay, when you when you t- when you ask them about something like, say, feminism, right? They'll say, well, if you just look at the dictionary definition of the word, it just means equality. But yet, when you bring up racism, they're like, oh no, it doesn't mean that. Right, right. Like, you know, know. like what? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, changing that. Like, yeah, you need you need power, you know, in this situation. And I mean, even if you were to. <laughs> Even if you were taking that, you know, you know, taking that, using that definition, I mean, let's be real, you know, power is this very fluid thing. Like, you know, there's a, multiple hierarchies in society, not just one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, my mother, you know, my mother is, you know, in her 70s. And if she's alone with a, uh, a young man of, of color who wishes to do her harm, there is a power dynamic there that, you know, is a physical power dynamic. She's a woman. He's a man. He's bigger. He's younger, you know. Uh, and and I I don't I don't get into that kind of bean counting you know check you know checklist sort of thing like I'm going to treat yeah. you this way versus that way and actually to give you guys an example of something that that happened recently on the you know stop making me defend uh, Donald Trump video um, this guy uh, wrote a wrote a comment um, he, he said uh, if you if if you if you use this much time and energy defending Trump. You're a shite person with fucked up priorities. Uh, to which the we the to which the we the internet response was: To be fair, it doesn't take much time to point out when somebody's got it wrong. Um, and then he wrote: <laughs> To be unfair, it does take time to write and shoot a video about how hard it is for poor fact-loving centrists to get along with those irrational liberals. And this is the key: How can how can my black and women coworkers say those things? I better jump in and fact check them. Of course, he's being a little, um, you, you know, a little uh, sarcastic Snarky, there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And to which, to which the response is, you know, we recommend treating your quote black and women coworkers like you would anyone else. They right. may appreciate it. And uh, I swear this is gonna be over soon. Uh, he wrote. Oh no! The old, yeah, he wrote the old. I don't see race, huh? And <laughs> no, and, and, and that's, and that's, and, and it's, uh, he, he said that, and, you know, to which we responded, no, see it. Just don't treat anyone better or worse because of it. Thank you. White kids. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah. it's yeah. so simple. And he gave a snarky, uh, you know, snarky uh, something to it. Like, oh, thanks for the lesson, buddy. Um, and, and it's a, it's a thing too, like where, you know, the idea that because I, I say treat people, you know, you know, equally, regardless of their race, that somehow jumping to I don't see race. It's like, ah, homie, like I see race all the, I see race all the time. Yeah. You know? um, and and it's it's I think I think the I, I'm a, I think the identity politics thing uh, is really dangerous and is no doubt tearing people uh, apart. And yeah, I would love to see just that shit just. You know, get thrown in the dustbin of history. Can yeah, I just throw in one last question, TJ? Yeah. I know we're over we're over time now, but well, I was, yeah, I was gonna... Lou, oh, no, Lou no, Perez, no, no. the We the Internet TV. It's been around for three years. Forty seven thousand subscribers. They always say the first hundred are the hardest to get. But what were, are your secrets to success? Help us out. Help out the viewers. Um, I think the secret the secrets to success is to definitely keep creating. Um, Keep putting stuff out there, and I think what what's so important, especially you know in the um, in in the field that we're in, is we need to foster relationships with the people who support us. Um, you know, we need to be able to if somebody writes you a fan letter, man, appreciate that. Like like 
be humbled by that. Be humbled by the fact that you are able to create something and someone else sees value in it and they like it so much that they want to reach out to you or they want to share uh, or they want to share your stuff. And uh, so that's something that that I've been really humbled um, by over the over the past, you know, past few years, and especially how this stuff has grown. And I've been able to foster relationships with you know, people who I would never have met before had I not put out this silly video that uh, <laughs> that that gets this guy talking about the the black people and women he works with in the office. Yeah. <laughs> Silver lining. Well, it's great. It's all good stuff, and uh, we really appreciate. Plugs. It. Yep, we're, that's that's where I'm going with okay. this. Is uh, let you, uh, let everybody know um, where we can catch you, what you're doing, what you're working on right now, and uh, the best way to support your work. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Uh, so please check out uh, We the Internet TV on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Lou on the Subway and. Every week, we're releasing uh, new videos. Uh, we usually release new videos every Wednesday and every Friday. So um, please check them out. Um, if you like them, share them. Uh, give us a, a thumbs up and uh, and reach out if uh, um, you know if you, if you like to if you like what you see. We we love um, getting uh, getting feedback. So. All right. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we so we really appreciate appreciate you coming by, and we're going to put the, the links uh, to all that stuff in the description below. Uh, in post, and we would sincerely from Atheist Edge, Jim, TJ, Lou, it was a pleasure. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you guys so much.